Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And I will be reading uh, from the King James Version, but then as I go through the sermon, I will be using ESV verses and translations there. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Exodus chapter 2, way at the beginning of the Bible, right after Genesis, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that this message, that it would bring hope, that it would bring strength, it would bring encouragement to us as we need it today, that you would be glorified. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, uh, the next time that you celebrate your birthday, as your friends and relatives are rejoicing and going out of their way to show you how much they love you and perhaps by even throwing you a surprise birthday party, showering you with gifts, you might want to take a moment or two that day and perhaps even during the party itself to publicly and formally give thanks first to God for giving you the gift of life to begin with and secondly, to none other than your mother. Yes, your father had something to do with you coming into being. But it was within your mother that you were conceived, wherein you were provided for and protected as you grew, until according to God's plan and his timing, your mother then gave birth to you. Now, you may no longer have the blessing of your mother's presence here in this life, but if you do, both on the anniversary of your own birth, as well as on Mother's Day, may she then be the first, the first one that you thank, and the one that you recognize and honor. For without the conscious decision, the commitment, and the loving sacrifice that she made on your behalf, you and I most definitely would not be here. Now our sermon passage for today gives us the account of how God along with one man and three women in particular were highly instrumental in both bringing forth and preserving the life of one of God's most important and revered servants, Moses. Now as we go through these verses, I would remind you that Moses is not only the one whose birth and early life are recorded here, but he is also the author of Exodus, the second of the five books of the Bible that are attributed to him, which include Genesis through Deuteronomy. Now he's writing this sometime after God has used Moses to deliver his people from their 400 year bondage in Egypt, and obviously prior to his own death, just before the Hebrew people that are led by Joshua across the Jordan River and they finally, finally enter the promised land. 
And one of the primary purposes of him writing and recording the extraordinary circumstances of his own birth was to clearly show the Hebrews how God was working to fulfill his promises to them by providing for and calling Moses as his chosen instrument for procuring their freedom as well as serving as God's prophet and their priest. That it was all God's plans and purposes being fulfilled and not Moses' own selfish desires or even his ambitions, which is a key fact that will plague the children of Israel continually, continually under Moses' leadership. As they constantly rejected him as their God-given leader, as well as failing to trust that God was able to fulfill his promises to them. For all intents and purposes, Moses should have never lived past the day of his birth. Concerned about the proliferation of the Hebrews there in Egypt being a threat to them, Pharaoh had decreed that every Hebrew boy that was born was to be killed by being thrown into the Nile. Now this was after, after his command to the Hebrew midwives to kill any males that were born to Hebrew women which failed to achieve his, his goal. Now all the people, all the people, not just the midwives, would be responsible for seeing that newborn Hebrew baby boys did not live. And with that being the law and the rule of the land, we read then in chapter 2, verse 1, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The couple is unnamed here, but later on in chapter 6, we find out that Moses' father was named Amron and that his mother was named Jochebed. Of particular importance here is the fact that both of his parents are from the tribe of Levi, the tribe that God will very soon designate as the one which will be responsible for the religious and the spiritual leadership of the new nation that he was forming. Now, while this unquestionably qualifies Moses as well as his siblings to fulfill the roles that God will call them to in our eyes, more importantly, it served as further evidence and proof that God was indeed at work in and through Moses to those who first read and heard the contents of this book. So following the marriage of Amram and Jochebed, we read in verse 2, the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. Now I should point out here that the son that was born now that we are reading about, although he was conceived under the new edict of death to newborn Hebrew boys, this was not the couple's first child. As we will see in just a few verses, this newborn son has an older sister, which we will learn later is named Miriam. And although we won't even see any mention of him in these verses, we will also find out later that Moses has a brother, Aaron, who is three years older than him as well. So besides the extraordinary circumstances surrounding Moses' birth, the verbiage describing Moses' birth here is somewhat ordinary. However, it does turn out that the expression, the woman conceived and bore a son, is the 16th, 1 6, 16th time and the last time that Moses, as the author of the first five books, will use it in the entire rest of his writing. Again, this would be highly significant to those who read this after Moses wrote it. Again, pointing out to the calling and the special ministry that Moses would fulfill and as such should not be missed by us either. This newborn son is also described as being fine or good or beautiful, depending on your translation, indicating that even at his birth, there seemed to be something special about him. Even so, as the good and loving mother that she was, she hid him for three months to protect him from those who would have taken him and ended his life by casting him into the river. Now, we do not take this verse to mean that his father, Amron, was not involved and did not care about his new son. 
That is not the case at all. In fact, in the hall of faith described in Hebrews chapter 11, both of Moses' parents are credited with great faith as verse 11 there states, I'm sorry, as verse 3 there states, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Newborns, as many of you are, are well accustomed to, they tend to sleep a lot when they are first born, but as they grow it becomes a little harder to hide them as well as their cries. Knowing that he was in increasing danger as he grew, we see in verse 3 that something had to be done to protect him. And so we read, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. Now, your translation may use the word basket as the ESV does or even ark as the King James does. It turns out that the Hebrew word here that Moses used is teba. Don't expect you to remember that, but you may want to remember this. It is the only other place in the entire scripture that that, that that word is specifically used is back in Genesis in chapter 6 through 8, which records the account of the great flood. And the vessel that God had Noah built that protected him, his family, and the animals from certain death by water. Again, as the author of Genesis as well, Moses is clearly indicating an association here between the protective ark that sheltered and saved Noah and his family with the ark or basket that was about to protect and save Moses. More than likely made of papyrus, the ark was covered with bitumen and pitch in order to seal it and keep it from sinking. Jochebed then put the child in it and placed it into the Nile among the reeds by the river bank, not out there in the main current. Now notice here that by putting her son in the Nile, that she had obeyed the letter, the letter of Pharaoh's law with respect to the newborn Hebrew boys. Although, although this was clearly not, clearly not uh, what Pharaoh had in mind when he came up with that edict. Now it is unlikely unlikely that she knew what was going to happen, but out of love and great faith, she provided the best protection that she could at that time for her precious little son. Moving on to verse 4, we see that Miriam, his sister, is also aware of this plan and involved in his protection as well, as we read, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Here we see his sister is tasked with, you will, of acting like a guard to watch over him and monitor what happens. She's clearly older than Moses, but not yet old enough where she would be expected to be working during the day. As a result, it would not have seemed suspicious for her then to be down there by the Nile looking out for her brother, whereas it would have been very suspicious for the mother or the father to have remained down there during the day. Now with Moses safely in his personal ark, if you will, and Miriam now watching to see what was going to happen to her little brother, who was thought to be safely hidden in the reeds, we move on then to find out what happens here in verse 5. In verse 5, we find another woman, one of Pharaoh's own daughters, who comes into the story, who undoubtedly knows her dad's edict, and, and one that we would more than likely expect to have been loyal to him. But Moses writes, Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant, servant woman, and she took it. Now, although he was supposed to be hidden in the reeds, once Pharaoh's daughter wades into the river as she's bathing, she has a, perhaps a better vantage point uh, than on the shore, or perhaps she actually does hear the baby make some noise in the, in the basket. But nonetheless, she sees the ark and sends one of her attendants to go get it for her. Verse 6 goes on to say, When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Now, probably not what she expected when she opened the basket, but she sees a young child. Actually, it is a young boy. And, it, and, and we know that because it is based on the Hebrew word that Moses wrote and that he was crying. At that moment... At that exact moment, she reacted out of a motherly concern and motherly love. She felt pity and compassion for the young boy. 
while at the same time, either because of his appearance, because the clothes that he was in, or maybe because of other cloth that was with him in the basket, she realizes this is indeed not an Egyptian boy, but a Hebrew baby boy. But still, that doesn't change her feelings, although it does pose now a conflict between her and her father. Now, meanwhile, Miriam, his sister and watchful guard, has seen what has occurred and has moved to position herself to be ready to offer some assistance to the princess, uh, who at this time may need help in caring for this young boy. And she quickly asked her then in verse 7, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Well, what a wonderful idea. And what immaculate and great timing here. Miriam seizes the moment and offers the princess valuable help while hoping to obtain safety as well as protection for her younger brother. Verse 8 tells us what happens next. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Now Pharaoh's daughter obviously sees value in this offer and answers with the single word and the command to go. And with that one word, Miriam goes off back to her own mother, Moses' mother, Jacobet, to tell her the good news and to bring her back to the princess. When they return, Moses goes on in verse 9 to tell us, And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, now talking to Jochebed, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. What an incredible, incredible turn of events. By God's providence, not only was Moses' life spared, but now for a good portion of the early and formative years of his life, he would live and actually be brought up in his own family, cared for by his own mother and father, who were actually paid and taken care of and protected him by the daughter and the, actually by the treasury of the very man who wanted him killed. And it was likely that during this period of time that he was then taught not only who he was, but who God was by his faithful Hebrew parents. Now, when his nursing was over, which was likely about three or four years, which is the, the time that, it, that they did so in ancient times, it was now time for him to be brought back to what was seen to be his adoptive mother. And so we read in verse 10, when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. And with that, Moses was then provided a royal upbringing that probably included the best education possible at that time, completely designed and orchestrated by God himself, all brought about in no small way because of three women. Either. His mother, his sister, and Pharaoh's daughter. Clearly, clearly God's hand was at work in Moses' life. Clearly, as God has Moses even record these and other events, we, as well as the original readers, are to see not only the faith, the faith of people like Moses' parents at work, but also the way in which God uses everything and everyone at his disposal to accomplish his goals and his purposes. Clearly, this is to strengthen our faith and put our trust, I'm sorry, and our trust in God, increasing our confidence and our assurance that, that God we serve is truly who he says he is and that no one and no thing can stand against him. Right. There's something else. There's something else that goes in this. In the first two chapters here in Exodus, there are five women. Five women who play incredible roles in God's plan of salvation. In chapter one, there are two Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, who defy Pharaoh's direct command to kill. These two women don't seem to have any direct impact when most was actually born, but their faith and their morality contributed greatly to the environment that Moses was born into and the inherent value that they realized that comes from the In chapter 2, Moses' mother, Yochebed, refuses 
to obey Pharaoh's edict to kill her own son when he was born. Miriam, Moses' sister, participates in the plan to protect her baby brother, also in defiance of Pharaoh's edict, and is instrumental in saving his life now and will be a valuable ministry partner with him later on in his life. Lastly, Pharaoh's own daughter. When she comes face to face with this Hebrew baby boy, knowing full well the command that her own father has placed on everyone in the kingdom, she also refuses to kill him. What these five women knew and lived out in their lives is the inherent truth that life is precious. It is a gift and that taking the life of a helpless baby is not only wrong, but it is absolutely and totally morally repugnant. God has placed within the heart and within the soul of every single human being the knowledge that babies are wonderful, special, truly a gift from God, incredibly helpless, be protected. That one of the most important roles that a woman can play in this world and in this life, as God has ordained it, is in the bearing, the preserving, and the raising of a child. And that God himself has placed that nurturing desire and capability into a woman. Knowing this and allowing God's inherent understanding of what is built into them, these five women, these five women rejected the call of a man and a nation to kill what threatened them. And instead to boldly and courageously do what they knew in their hearts was right and the loving thing to do. They preserved and protected the life of this Hebrew baby boy. And two, two very special women, Jochebed, his biological mother, and the unnamed daughter of Pharaoh, become part of God's plan for the salvation of Israel, for the salvation of Egypt, and for the salvation of the entire world. Today on this Mother's Day, we pay honor and remember God first, our own mother second, and all the other women in the world who recognized and courageously made the decision to choose life, to protect life, and to give life, that you and I might be here today and that each and every day thereafter that we can fulfill God's rescue plan of salvation the free gift of eternal life to all that know believe and put their trust in his one and only son Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and like these five women then may we too stand in faith against all the forces of evil that would seek to destroy the helpless, innocent, and precious gift of life that God gives us through a woman and through our mother. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today thanking you for the gift of life. We thank you for the design that you came up with, the way in which you made men and women, the design of marriage, the design of family. Father, we thank you for women who are willing to not only receive the gift that you have given to them, but to be used by you to bring life to bear life, 
and to preserve life into this world. Father, I ask that you would comfort those that remember their mothers today as they have already gone home to be with you. That you would comfort them and give them sweet memories of what their loving mother did for them. Father, that as we honor our mothers today, whether alive or dead, that we would be models and be people that they would be proud of. That we too would hear the call, understand the way in which we are made, understand that it is you who is the giver of life, that there are no mistakes. And Father God, that you would help to empower us, to strengthen us, that we too would be like these five women, protectors of life. But we thank you, we need you, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.